Okay, we are live, mm. Alexander. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Delighted to be here again, uh, doing a live stream. Yeah, you're a little blurry, but it'll clear up. In I'm like a little minutes, blurry. Well, you know, the, the, yeah. well, pixelated, the, 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 pixelated. The, the pixelated. Well, the Oracle of Delphi always spoke through a mist, <laughs> so I suppose the same happened. Didn't he? But uh, you know, uh, 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 this mist will clear up, whereas that in Delphi apparently never did. Yeah. So let's say hello to our moderators, Alexander. Then we'll uh, mm. get to the topic and just answer questions from um, from YouTube, Odyssey, Rumble, Locals, mm. the chat in Locals, uh, Telegram. We'll answer whatever questions we can about what's going on in the world. So thank you to everybody who is joining us wherever you are in the world. And we hope you are having a really good Thursday. And hello to our amazing, awesome moderators. Valies is with us. Valies, it's good to have you here. The great Zarael, the man of mystery, Zarael, how are you doing today? And uh, who else is moderating? Um, Catherine, Catherine. Good to have you on board. And I think that is everybody who is moderating today and myself and myself. I am also going to be moderating as uh, the Oracle speaks. Alexander, um, let's see here. Everyone hit that like. Um, drop us uh, questions wherever you're watching from, whether it's Rumble or Odyssey or Telegram. Check out our Telegram channel, the Duran.locals. Dot com. Uh, did I mention? I said Rumble, Odyssey, Locals, Telegram. Mm. Okay. Mm. <laughs> I think I got all the platforms. And of course, YouTube, our mm. YouTube chat. Hope everybody's doing mm. well in the chat on YouTube. So, um, Alexander, we uh, had a speech from um, mm. Putin during the mm. Moscow International Security Conference. Shoigu as well. From yeah. The Minister of Defense Shoigu. Absolutely. And uh, I think of this as a kind of, I don't want to say a declaration of, of war. That sounds so cliche. I mean, it was, mm. it, it was Putin really lashing out at the globalist world order, but yeah. in a clever way, kind of t signaling mm. to the world that we do indeed have uh, two parallel uh, systems that are mm. running. One, mm -hmm. one is being developed. The other one, we all know it all too well. And that Russia is going to be uh, leading the way in this new parallel system, along with China, mm. perhaps India, perhaps Turkey. I would say definitely Iran, Eurasia, mm. and all of these countries, Latin America, various mm. countries mm. in Africa. What did you uh, make of the speech from Putin? Because, and Shuegu, because a lot of um, outlets are not, uh, are not covering the speech. Uh, they, they've kind no. of glossed it over. A lot of the mainstream media, obviously, is not covering it at all because they never cover what Putin has to say. But uh, no. we've been saying it for a while now on this channel that uh, Putin is indeed uh, going after the globalists and he's looking to, uh, to yeah. take on the globalist world order, perhaps even tear it apart. And it's always been one of the most popular questions we've always received on our yeah. uh, live streams. Is Putin a globalist? I think now mm. we can say without a shadow of a doubt that he is not a globalist. May he have been... Uh, may, may, maybe in the past, he might have subscribed to globalism, maybe in order to gain certain benefits yeah. from the globalist system. Mm. Um, mm. He mm. attended globalist conferences. Absolutely. Uh, did he take advantage mm. of the globalist world order while he had the chance? Most yeah. definitely. But reading this speech, it's clear that he never subscribed to the globalist ideology. And now he's just kind of throwing it all out there and admitting it and saying, not only do I not subscribe to this ideology, but I'm out of this system and whoever wants to join me, come along. So Alexander, what do you make? What did you make of the speech? You gave a really good um, summary of, the, of that mm -hmm. speech on your channel as well. So uh, check yeah. out Alexander's channel where he goes over the, the speech in detail. It's a two part video, but uh, tell us all yeah. what you uh, saw in that speech. 
I thought it was the most extraordinary speech Putin has ever given, actually. And I follow many of his speeches. Now, Putin has made speeches about globalism increasingly often recently, and he gets more critical about it every time. But in this speech, the speech that he's just made, well, not only did he make it absolutely clear that he is completely opposed to it, but he repeated so many of the talking points about globalism and globalists that you hear others make. So first of all, he spoke about not just globalism. He spoke about globalists, the new, the uh, um, Western globalist elite. Those are his words. That's what he said. So he said that there is a group of people, a Western globalist elite, who have been promoting globalism. And so he identifies them as the adversary. And I mean, you said that this wasn't a declaration of war, but he made it very clear that he opposes these people and that he considers them an adversary and himself an adversary to them. So I mean, he, he specifically said there is a globalist elite, a globalist network, that they are the people who are promoting hegemonism. He also said that there is supranational national group. In other words, they don't owe any particular loyalty to any particular state. Rather, they uh, um, control states in the West as part and use their control of those states you know, in order to promote this globalist project. He also said that one of the tools they use, or, you know, their, their preferred tool for promoting this globalist project is to create chaos. He actually used the word chaos. So, you know, we often hear about how, you know, the globalists like chaos, they ferment chaos, they think they can ride the wave of chaos uh, in order to carry out their reset agendas and all that sort of thing. Well, Putin actually said that. <laughs> he actually said that they promote chaos, they promote conflict, they promote wars, they interfere in other countries, they do all of this thing. And he said also uh, uh, that one of the things they do is that they impose they, one of the mechanisms they also use in order to promote their hegemonism is that they don't, don't just interfere in other countries, but they try to inject into those countries social and uh, lifestyle and identity ideas. We have to be very careful when we're on YouTube talking about these things. But he said he does, they do that, which are alien to these societies. Now, you said this was a clever speech. It was an extremely clever speech. And I'm going to explain why. Now, this is an international security conference. It took place in Moscow. There were international, there were people, security people, in other words, soldiers, army officers, security experts, security officials from lots and lots of countries attending this conference. Of course, they weren't from the West. They were from the global South, from countries like India, Asia, Latin America, Africa. Shoigu, the defense minister, went through all of the places where these people have come from, all the regions these places have come, people have come from. They are, in other words, overwhelmingly from those places which were either part of the former European colonial empires, the empires run by Britain, France, Spain, Portugal, the Netherlands and all those others, or they were also part of the informal empires that were created at the same period by other Western great powers like Britain in Latin America and the United States. So. He is telling them what are, what are these globalists ultimately all about? Well, they are, they want to set up this hegemonic global project, and they are going to do that by fermenting chaos, disrupting your societies, um, imposing ideas alien to those societies. They want to break down your states. He was very clear about the fact that this is all about creating a single central place where rules are laid down, international law is thrown out of the window. 
This is something that is fundamentally adver adverse to states. But they're going to do this so that they can exploit you. <laughs> they can take your resources. He used the word sponge off you <laughs> in exactly the kind of way that the former colonial empires did. In is that other a quote? Words, he actually said this sponge? Is just another. Yeah, absolutely. You see, he actually said sponge. It's actually there in the Kremlin's readout. Sponge off you so that, you know, they will exploit you, sponge off you in exactly the same way that the former colonial empires did. So globalism is simply a new form of colonialism, imperialism directed at you. We are opposing it. We, Russia, are opposing it. Our conflict in Ukraine is part of that, opposing it. And, of course, that means, ultimately, what we're doing is we're fighting for you. And you need to support us because um, we are ultimately fighting your side against this hegemonic globalist agenda, which wants to disrupt your societies, take away your independence by destroying your states, and ultimately... Uh, um, exploiting you and sponging off you. There was a clever speech. It was also a speech, as I said, that was very, it was very pitched to its audience, but it was also very clear that globalism is the enemy. So I thought it was an extremely interesting speech, one of the most uh, 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 carefully calibrated speeches that Putin has ever given, but also one in which he basically dropped the mask because, of course, as you correctly said, he's gone along, as the Chinese have done, by the way, uh, with a lot of the globalist rhetoric up to now, you know, talked about all the various things that globalists have talked about, you know, free trade and all that. But, of course, ultimately, uh, deep down, one senses he's never really been sold on this thing. Uh, he's tried to use it to Russia's advantage just as the Chinese have used globalism very much to their own advantage. He now realizes this has reached its limit. It's no longer possible. And now he's come out openly, straightforwardly and said, um, I'm against this. You should be against it as well. You in the global south should be against it as well. So given that, support me, support Russia, support we are, what we are doing, because we're fighting your battle. Wow. All right. Boy, is the Davos crowd really going to hate Putin now. You thought they hated him before? They're going to really hate him now. So um, can you uh, give us a little bit of information as to the speech that Shoigu gave as well? And I thought this was also mm. uh, an incredible speech because Shoigu also talked a lot about yeah. the, uh, the military operation, the conflict Absolutely. in Ukraine as well. And I think it's an extraordinary speech, Alexander, given the fact mm. that Shoigu was able to make this speech because yes. this must be his twentieth heart attack, I think, according to the uh, to the mainstream media in the in the West. <laughs> so after no, about twenty no. heart attacks, he looked pretty good for for a man who suffered uh, no. so many heart conditions. Yeah. Well, indeed, of course, Putin, as we know, suffers from Parkinson's, cancer, <laughs> every conceivable disease under the sun. And assure you, it's even worse. I mean, you know, some reports, uh, uh, you know, put him on death's door. I, mean, I haven't seen him been quite dead but anyway he he did look uh, as you said remarkably well for somebody who's been ridden off so many times sacked as well i seem to remember he'd also been sacked at one point or was about to be sacked but anyway there he was and um firstly it was the longest speech i've ever seen shoigu give to an international audience and i have to say um, and it's a point I made on my own video. That is unusual. That's very surprising. I mean, usually a person who is subordinate to Putin in the you know Russian hierarchy would not be expected to give a speech that was actually longer than Putin's own. And I take the point that many people have made that this is a speech made to people from, you know, security and defense backgrounds in various countries. And that's why Shoigu, who is... The, the host, the nominal host, um, you know, address these people. But that doesn't explain why he addressed them for as long as he did. And he did, in fact, he gave a very long speech. And firstly, 
he completely endorsed, as one might expect, all of Putin's comments about, you know, uh, uh, globalism, unipolar policies, hegemonism on the part of the West. So he went through all of that. He then talked about the military operation. And he not only said, we're winning, but he also said, we're winning against the West. Ukraine, we're not really fighting Ukraine. All that Ukraine is doing is it's providing the manpower, you know, the the, the cannon fodder. He didn't use that expression, but essentially that's what he said. The cannon fodder, which he implied the West is cynically using to wage this war. But it's the West that Russia is really fighting. They're the, they're the people who are providing the financial aid to Ukraine, the weapon systems to Ukraine. So despite the fact that we're up against the entire collective West, we are winning. The implication being, of course, that if we can take them on and win, so can you in the global south. You know, we're there. We, we can show we show that you can defeat these people. We can we can just defeat their wonder weapons. He actually said that. He actually used those expressions, you know, their, their javelins and the Barakta drones and the HIMARS systems. We've dispelled, we've exposed the myth of all of these systems. They're not really anywhere near as effective as people in the West pretend they are. We've proved that. So we can defeat these people. We have the technology, the industrial skills, the military skills to beat them. And with us on your side, you in the global south can do the same. You don't have to submit to these people because their military power is something that we can balance. But he said something else about the military situation, which I thought was really remarkable, was that he said that NATO knows that the Russians are going to win this war, that despite all the support that they've been giving to Ukraine, deep not deep down, I mean, at, at an actual level of you know discussion, private discussion within NATO, they know they are losing. And there are good reasons to think that NATO actually does know that, because we're now getting more and more information from Ukrainian sources, and I stress Ukrainian sources, corroborating something that we on the Duran were saying months ago, which is that this flood of weapons to Ukraine is actually running down. Apparently, weapons deliveries from Europe have practically stopped. And the latest arms supplies from the US are falling. There's no more helicopters, no more high Mars launchers, uh, um, infantry fighting vehicles, all of those things. That it's, it's actually running down. Western military support is running down. And the reason it is running down is because the West has done the figures, they've done the sums, and they see that sending more weapon systems is not just depleting the West's own arsenals, but it's not achieving the results on the battlefields in Ukraine that the West thought it was. So the West knows it is losing. That's what Shoigu said. I think he's almost certainly right. And, of course, he then went through this long list of regions. He talked about that in America. He talked about Africa. He talked about the Middle East. He talked about East Asia. He talked about all of these regions. And he said, you know, he, 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 he was basically saying, you know, this is all about you. This is what the West is doing in your particular region. This is what we're doing to counter it here by fighting this war in Ukraine. And he gave this extraordinary, what the French call a tour d'horizon, and, uh, you know, this wide coverage of the globe, taking it region by region, plate by region, making it clear, in effect, that this isn't just a regional conflict in Ukraine, but a global conflict between Russia and the hegemonist forces, the globalist forces in the West, and that Russia stands for the global South against globalism. It's quite an extraordinary speech again. Very, very remarkable. And I think 
it's gaining traction. Now, um, we, you, we, you, you've been making reports on your channel about the Vostok exercises, the Eastern mm. exercises that the Russians are going to carry out in the Far East. We've now had confirmation that China is going to join those exercises. But I've also heard a report that India is going to participate also. It's been on zero hedge. So we see how countries outside the West are now participating in what the Russians are doing. They don't really like globalism either. They sense that this is ultimately a, an attack on their hard-won independence. The, the, you know, what they fought the anti-colonial struggle for. And they're quietly rallying to the course that Putin and Shoigu are offering them. And can I just say, not only did Putin and Shoigu look physically very well, but they came across to me as looking extremely confident. These were two very confident leaders speaking out in the way that they did. Um, they looked relaxed. They looked very sure of themselves. And one senses that they not only feel that things in Ukraine are going their way, but that things in the world struggle, if you like, are going their way also. Yeah, uh, a couple of comments uh, to what you said, Alexander. I, I would actually say that China mm. is now coming out more overtly and showing their support for mm. Russia ever since everything that happened in Taiwan. Mm. And they actually even made a statement yesterday thanking yeah. Russia for backing uh, China with regards to, to Pelosi's trip to Taiwan. So I think that China is now not as uh, reserved to show its support no. for Russia to kind of say, we've mm. got your back. At least that's the sense that I'm getting. Um, I also think that after watching Shoigu give that speech, uh, he looked like a potential president, maybe. Yes, I maybe. thought the same, actually. I, I thought, that's, I thought that's exactly the same. Yeah. No, you know, that's not a prediction. That's not no. a prediction. But it's the most high-profile speech that any subordinate of Putin's has given that I can remember. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I've never seen any subordinate of Putin's give a speech on the same day that the president himself has given a speech, which was actually as substantive and as long as the president's own. And in any other circumstance, I would have said that it clearly earmarks Shoigu as a potential successor. So I, I agree with that. Now, I, I have to say there are still problems here in that Shoigu and Putin are almost the same age. They're the same generation. Putin is supposed to yeah. be able to continue for two more terms. Shoigu would be fairly old if he were to succeed at that point. It may be that there's been some kind of decision, but whatever, it did look to me as an attempt to, as a decision to bring Shoigu forward to increase his international profile in a way that could point to him as a potential president. So I've just, I, I have to say, I agree with that. I'm not saying that is what is going to happen. That's not a prediction. But if we were to hear that in two years, three years time, Putin is standing down and Shoigu is taking over on the strength of this speech, I would not be surprised. Yeah. Can you contrast the way you saw the speech from Putin and uh, Shoigu with Biden's appearance yesterday as he was signing the Inflation Reduction Act, which is just another slush fund for uh, renewables no, and climate change activists and just all, all of these yeah. things, institutions and all of these things. That's all it is. Uh, it's a slush fund for all this stuff. But uh, Biden looked visibly lost and confused I thought during so. a simple signature signing ceremony. He looked just lost in space. And uh, then you have these guys coming out yeah. and giving these long, uh, very, very important, very strong speeches about what's going on. I mean, just contrast those two, and then we'll get into all the questions. And, Absolutely. And I mean, start, uh, we, long, yeah. but structured, purposeful, and clear speeches. I mean, one of the things about these two speeches is that though they were long, they're actually quite easy to read. <laughs> 
you can go through them quite quite easily because they, they are so well constructed. Whereas Biden, I have to say this, I mean, he's he comes across almost with every appearance now, looking increasingly rambling and unfocused. I'm again choosing my words very, very carefully. But, you know, as the leader of the free world, inverted commas, which is how they've been trying to build him up, he just doesn't look convincing at all. It's uh, I've never seen Western leadership look so lost as it does at the moment. OK, uh, Shoigu, I thought it was really interesting that uh, mm -hmm. that he mentioned the wonder weapons. No. It's almost like he's obviously he's reading everything that uh, that is coming out of the uh, the opponents and, and he's reading all these wonder weapon uh, stories. And he's like, look, mm -hmm. we've, these aren't an issue for us. I thought that was uh, really interesting. Yeah. And, and the fact that he said that they are taking on NATO. I mean, we're hearing this yeah. as well, more and more from uh, from the Kremlin yeah. and higher up in uh, in uh, Putin's administration that uh, they're, they, they've almost dismissed the fact that they're in a conflict with Ukraine at this point. You know, they're yeah. like, look, we're taking on NATO. Let's just cut the BS. This is a NATO exactly. army. These are NATO fortifications. This is NATO funded. And I wonder if that's freaking out uh, the EU, aside from the economic <laughs> collapse, aside from the energy collapse. Ursula has been super quiet. I mean, Vander Crazy mm. has just been like, mm. I, I haven't heard from mm. her in like two weeks. And, mm. um, you know, uh, Borrell is just spouting off nonsense about how European mm. citizens have to suffer in order yeah. to uh, to fight this war. And he called it a war. I wonder if all of yeah. this is just throwing uh, Europe just off off kilt, off, off kilter. You know, they're they're scaling back on weapons. Politico wrote an article about it. The Hill wrote an article about it. Der Spiegel yeah. wrote an article about it. They're all coming yeah. out and they're saying EU has been demilitarized in essence. It just yes. doesn't have any more weapons. I, th I think exactly. it was um, Der Spiegel, Alexander, actually used the, the word an ammunition diet. Europe is going to put <laughs> Ukraine on an ammunition diet. Mm. This is a time, by the way, when Russian artillery uh, 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 you know, expenditure in Donbass is now back at 60 to 70,000 rounds a day. <laughs> so the Russians seem to have an unlimited supply of ammunition. In fact, there was an extraordinary um, comment that I read by a Ukrainian soldier, which was published um, in some, I think, I think it was in some, um, I think it was the Washington Post, actually, where he said that the Russians are able to just churn out these weapons as if they come out from a machine, which, of course, they do. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly what is happening. But the Russian MIC is just churning them out, whereas it seems that the West can't do so. But you're absolutely right. And I'm going to make a guess. The person who is in, well, the other person who you notice has vanished from all, vanished without trace. Is Boris Johnson? What's happened to him? I'll tell you. I'll tell you what's happened. He's here. He's on holiday. He's in Greece. <laughs> exactly. Yes, he's in Greece, and apparently he's given instructions that he's not to be contacted by Whitehall except in case of urgent need, whatever that means. So you know, he's the Prime Minister of Britain, and he's practically gone AWOL. I mean, he's he's banished, but you know, so. Boris is nowhere to be seen. Ursula, as you said, has gone quiet. Biden is looking confused. Liz Truss, there's more concerns about her mounting every day. I mean, you know, even, even places like the Daily Telegraph, where, you know, they've been supporting her, they're now starting to get a bit concerned that she's not really coming up with any practical solutions. But the person who I think... Schultz must is be in trouble. Schultz is in trouble. I was going to say the, the, the person who I think is in most under most pressure. Well, it's the Schultz Habeck axis in Germany, because, you know, what Habeck was doing at the beginning of this year in March was that he was buying gas at record levels from the Russians in order to fill up the gas reserves before the autumn. And I think he thought that he'd be able, the Russians would let him do that because he thought that the Russians needed the money. And I think he thought that that would help him pretend in the autumn that, you know, Germany had rid itself of dependence on Russian gas supplies. And he put out all the stories that he was getting LNG from Qatar and LNG from the US. 
And of course, the Russians <laughs> figured it out and all these convenient turbines <laughs> then appeared and needed maintenance and refurbishment and can't be made to work. And we've seen the Russian gas supplies have been falling and we now have a mood of, oh, I wouldn't quite say panic, but growing worry in Germany because they don't really know, it seems to me, what they're going to do because they they don't have full amount of gas that they need to get through the winter. They're cutting back on their supplies, on 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 you know on the gas that they're using. We did a program about this fairly recently. Inflation in Britain is at ten point one percent. The Secretary General of OPEC has now said OPEC oil production is as high as it can possibly go. The Chinese seem to be taking steps to reflate the eco their economy, so it's likely oil prices are going to rise again come the autumn. I mean, they, they dipped, but this has been, you know, it's a common pattern in inflation crises that there's dips and then upward spikes. So th they're in trouble and they know it, but they don't know what to do. <laughs> uh, they don't have any real options. Some people in Germany now are talking about opening Nord Stream 2. Now, mm -hmm. if they're talking like that in Germany, that tells you how critical the situation is becoming. So, you know, all they can do is keep their fingers crossed, hope that something will come. And at the same time, you're getting these very, very confident speeches from Putin. And from Shoigu. So, it, again, people in the global south, in India, in the African states, uh, another little straw in the wind, apparently Mali, a major important country in West Africa, big country, has now basically chucked out all the French soldiers, all the French administrators who were there. They've now completely accepted all the help from Russia. I thought at the beginning that this was, you know, uh, Mali inviting the Russians in was basically in order to give them leverage with France. I th still think that, actually. But I think the Malians have now decided we're not going to get any help from France. France is a exhausted force. Let's turn to the rising sun instead of the setting sun. Russia is growing stronger. It's winning in Ukraine. Its economy is absorbing all the sanctions blows. We've had more information from the economics ministry in Moscow, the GDP contraction. It's they, they've reduced it with every every report, the GDP contraction this year is getting smaller. So, you know, they were saying 12 percent in March. Now, it, then it was 6 percent. Now it's just 4 percent it might be revised down even further. And inflation in Russia continues to fall. Before very long, it will be less. The annualized rate of inflation will be less than what we see in the West. So people are looking at all of this and they're coming to their own conclusions. And Mali has opted to go with Russia instead of France. India is joining, it seems, the Vostok games. The Russians have apparently found... Um, customers for all their coal which uh, um europe refused to buy remember that you know the coal that europe was going wasn't going to buy the russians have apparently found customers for all of that coal they're apparently finding customers for all their oil somebody on my live stream um on locals yesterday said that the indians are insuring all the oil that they import from russia so the london insurance market has already been cut out of that crucial oil trade. So you can see things are turning in a particular direction. Yeah, just to, just to summarize it, um, let's see. Mali kicks out France, they invite Russia in. Yeah. Uh, Xi Jinping is going to be traveling to meet with MBS. Yeah. Um, Qatar tells uh, German energy majors that they have no LNG to give them. Yeah. Uh, Russia is having military games in the Vostok in the east. 
They're going to be having huge exercises with China, possibly India as well. They have the Army uh, 2022 games as well that they're holding. All of the, the mm-hmm. talk about Russia collapsing, about the mm-hmm. military is, is depleted. It's 80% committed yeah. in Ukraine. Um, you know, the, the, the Kremlin is falling apart. They're in disarray. 50 generals have perished. It just all seems like the whole narrative is completely yeah. falling apart. Yeah. And just to wrap things up, now I think the Russians are focusing on breaking apart the Zaporozhye artillery uh, narrative yeah. as well, because they continue almost like on an hourly basis to say, we want the UN here to inspect. We want someone right. here ASAP. And the UN, for its part, they continue to avoid it. And we all know why they avoid sending someone there. It's clear, crystal clear. So what what do you think about what I've just said as a summary of everything going on? And uh, if you want to add to that. And then I, what, do you, what do you say we do questions after after that? Absolutely. Well, look, I just want just one other thing, which is, of course, one thing which hasn't been going on and which the Western media was full of week after week, months even, the Herson counteroffensive, which was supposed to start this August. Where is it? No sign of it. And uh, a German journalist from Bild, Zeitung, has said that, and apparently in all serious, Ukraine doesn't need an army of half a million men. It needs an army of five million men to beat Russia. Where is an ar- where's Ukraine going to get an army of five million men? I mean, it, when people start talking like that, you, you know that it's all lost. And that very same German journalist from Bill Zeitung came to said that, you know, all this talk about Russia being exhausted, having run out of steam in Ukraine, it's all absolute nonsense. So he said that, and that's why Ukraine needs this army of five million men. And as for the Zaporozhye nuclear power station, the reason the UA, UN won't go, the reason the International Atomic Energy Agency won't go there, we all know it. They, If they go there, they will have to confirm who is actually shelling the nuclear power station. And, of course, that may be something you can obfuscate for a while in the Western media. But again, the global South isn't fooled. India isn't fooled. Mexico isn't fooled. South Africa isn't fooled. China isn't fooled. Turkey isn't fooled. They all know who is shelling the power station. Yeah. A quick comment on uh, the sabotage activities in Crimea, Alexander, yeah. real quick. Yeah. I think that's a big story. It is a big story. But again, we must keep it in context. Now, I, I, I've got a little bit of information here, which I can't corroborate. I mean, I don't know whether this is true or not, but I will say this. Um, it seems that the way these strikes have been done is that there is some group operating in Crimea. We don't know how big they are. They make... They put together makeshift drones, which are difficult to spot. They fly over these facilities, drop small homemade bombs on ammunition dumps, fuel things, and that causes these explosions. What it shows is two things. Firstly, that the Ukrainians do have some kind of a sabotage group in Crimea, which is a very bad lapse in Russian security. And the Russians will be very worried about that. That's the first thing. The second thing is that there is very, very bad security on Russian rear bases. Now, this attack on that ammunition depot in northern Crimea, um, I've now seen what claim to be pictures of that ammunition depot. And it's right beside roads and a big railway line. It was fairly small. I didn't see any guards. It seems to be just ammunition piled up with trucks in an open field. I mean, there's no real attempt to secure that place at all. And frankly, I mean, it's almost an invitation to attack it. So I think the Russians will be tightening up on that as well. But the third point is, It's not going to make any difference to the direction of the war. Now, some see this as, you know, preparing for a Ukrainian attack on Crimea. If the Ukrainians think that, you know, these little pinprick attacks are going to make possible an attack on Crimea, um, 
then I think that is absolute fantasy. That's absolutely not going to happen. It's just an, uh, an absurdity. My own view, my own personal view, is that the reason these attacks are happening is to divert attention from the great event which hasn't happened, which is the Hurston counteroffensive. Everybody for weeks waiting for this counteroffensive. We've now had articles in the Washington Post, the London Review of Books, The Economist, The Guardian. Um, these are just the places that I've seen which basically admit what is now blindingly obvious or increasingly obvious, which is that Ukraine is in no position to launch this counteroffensive against her song region. There is huge, I sense, huge feeling of disappointment, at the very least, in certainly the British media, that this Herson counteroffensive isn't happening. A lot of people have lost face. So we now have these little pinprick attacks in Crimea, partly to give the media in the West something to write about now that they can't write about a counteroffensive that hasn't happened. Yeah. I always remember what uh, Jacob Dreisen said during one of our live streams. He said the last time the Ukraine military was able to uh, launch a counteroffensive was in 2015. I mean, he yeah. just basically said they, they just can't do it. They're, no. They just don't have it in them. Absolutely. Yeah. I think Andrei Martyanov has been saying something similar. Yeah, Andrei Martyanov has also said that, yes. Ben also said this. And, and, and you know, we can, we, we can now see it. And, of course, with Western arms supplies dwindling, their ability to do it is reducing. And, of course, they're also suffering these enormous losses. So, as I said, their capacity to launch counteroffensives are just dwindling away. Yeah, but they keep on sending forces to the to the front line, and now they've got this uh, this swapping out. So maybe you might be seeing the swapping out of uh, the commander Zeluzny for somebody else, and, and all of these things that are going on. So you know, Alensky is, yeah. is is still still focused on uh, on on moving military assets yeah. to uh, to Donbas. It seems. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, a policy which, I mean, I'm, as I said, not a military person, but it makes no sense to me. But that's what he seems to be doing. And as you absolutely rightly say, he seems to be preparing to uh, fire Zaluzhny, you know, promote him upstairs <laughs> to defence minister, but put his own people in place so that he can continue to throw young and not so young now Ukrainians into the slaughter which I personally find deeply shocking and absolutely, absolutely awful. But that seems to be what the Ukrainian government is trapped, trapped into doing, has trapped itself into doing. Yeah. Okay. Any other uh, issues, thoughts, stories you want to talk about? I think this is, get some... I think I, 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 I did a live stream yesterday on locals where I said, I thought August was a tipping point and I think it is. I, I think that we've now, uh, previously, back in March, there was a chance that you could settle Ukraine, the conflict in Ukraine, reach some kind of agreement and, you know, contain this crisis. It's now clear that opportunity has been lost. The crisis has gone global. And this August, this August, we can start to see clearly who the winners and who the losers are going to be. And as I said, August, this August has been the tipping point, in my opinion. By the way, I, I sent to you an article in the Telegraph, my email, it said Ukraine has three months, <laughs> I don't know why they arbitrarily they think it's three months, three months to avoid betrayal. So even in the Telegraph, the pen is beginning to drop. What does that, that Ukraine mean, betrayal? Is losing the war. Yeah, because you're hearing a well, lot. They're going to get stabbed because, in the back. They're yeah, I know. I know. No, stabbed in the back, mm -hmm. exactly. Because, But I mean, the point is that, you know, the economic crisis is now so bad in the West that they can't sustain the support for Ukraine anymore. And that without Western arms supplies, that's another point the article makes, Ukraine can't continue the war. Let's do some uh, questions. questions. We got a lot of great, 
questions, Alexander. Yeah. Um, Radio Serbona 7530, thank you very much for that super chat. David S., thank you for that super sticker. Jungle Jin says, what if Russia responded to a predetermined failure by the U.S. to recognize an up-and-coming referendum in Ukraine and thus an expanded Russia by recognizing the Treaty of Hidalgo? How would the world react? <laughs> well, I don't know how the world would react, but I think this, what we can say what we can say is that increasingly the world is becoming impatient with the United States. And if the United States doesn't recognize referenda in um, Ukraine, which I'm sure they won't, it doesn't follow that the rest of the world will pay much notice. And I think the Russians, for their part, will not want to stir things up by trying to embarrass the US in the way that you said, because frankly, why why would they need to? Things are already going their way. And that's what I think that the Russians will do. They'll say, you know, we've held this referendum. As far as we're concerned, this problem is now resolved. The rest of the world basically agrees. And if the West doesn't like it, well, the United States doesn't like it. Well, that's its problem, not ours. Yeah. Um, ben Redward says, Canadian Bandera clown CBC News claim the war is not going well for Russia and Ukraine will soon launch a counteroffensive in Kherson that will defeat oh. Putin. MSN clown yeah. show. Yeah, I know exactly. I mean, you still get these people who say who say that they're still they're still talking about this Kherson counteroffensive. As I said, the first article I read about a counteroffensive by by Ukraine in Kherson region was in the Daily Telegraph in March. I mean, I, 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 you know, I'd wondered whether it went back that far, but it does. It, it, it's, it talks, the article specifically says that Russia's grip on Ukrainian cities is slipping and that Russia is about to lose control of her song. And that was in March. And every couple of weeks we hear more, you know, that this her song counteroffensive is going to happen. Well, where is it? Michael G says, yeah, the boys. Thank you, Michael G, for that. Jeff, the Husser says, Galimera to you both. I believe you are now more famous than Walter Cronkite. Wife and oh, I wow. love all your shows. Well, well, I, I think you. not. Actually. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I yeah, so I mean that, 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 that we're not we're not we're not quite yeah. there yet. But you know, uh, I'll give it time. <laughs> Co <laughs> Commando Crossfire says, we find ourselves in a unique situation. There has never been uh, a bloodless revolution or a nonviolent revolution. That don't happen even in hollywood yeah i mean i take your point um I, I i i have a strong aversion to bloodshed and as i said many times i hope in the west that um, our political structures remain strong enough to carry out the changes that need to be made without the kind of scenarios that you've outlined but with every day that passes the risk of something going horribly wrong or something like what you've described become they they grow they become greater yeah summer of 1970 thank you for that super sticker is that here thank you for that super sticker sparky says biden replaces kamala with liz cheney then steps down leaving liz as president how's that for an evil globalist plan maniacal laughter Modern not <laughs> yeah, not, imp not impossible. impossible after all yeah. i mean did, did you hear did you did you did you hear or read her speech well, after she's, she's she abraham lincoln primary? she's abraham lincoln exactly yeah. i mean you know, this is, well, she's just abraham lincoln she's also ulysses grant yeah. <laughs> you know, I whom, mean, they hate, you know, whom they hate whom they hate they tear down exactly. statues of exactly exactly so i mean you know so you know you know, may, maybe her march. You know, she's, she's marching all the way to the White House, and you know, I, I you know, I don't. I, I appreciate what you're making. So you're saying is a joke, but be yeah, careful like what jokes you make because be you know careful, these, these extreme, extreme <laughs> yeah. scenarios that you outline yeah. are not uh, entirely <laughs> off, off the you know, uh, impossible. I have no, to say, it was no, the most bizarre no. speech by a loser I have ever heard. I mean, not just a loser. Was it? Well, how did she lose? Was it twenty six percent margin? Oh, yeah. Or something? I mean, I don't remember, but it was huge. Yeah, but she's not going to disappear. So that's what worries no, me. Not, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, Red Pill Scholar says, and, Bra and Brazil in all this, will the U.S. co-opt them? Brazil, that's an interesting one. No, I don't think they will. I mean, already you see Bolsonaro, who is, remember, the pro-American president of Brazil. Though, when we say pro-American, I mean, he was pro-American when Trump was president. I don't think he likes <laughs> much time for Biden, actually. I mean, I'm sure he doesn't. I mean, I'm too less compatible people it's difficult to imagine than bolsonaro and biden but even bolsonaro went to moscow you know at one point and he seems to have good good relations with um with putin and of course if the next president of brazil is lula da silva which most people still think you know he may have lots of different views about lula da silva i should say i am not a fan of Lula da Silva, but you know, uh, if it is Lula da Silva, he was one of the founder members of BRICS, of the BRICS group. And everything that he has said suggests that he's going to integrate Brazil more closely in the BRICS again. And that's the direction that he's going to follow. So I think Brazil, and indeed most of Latin America, is going to drift away. Yeah. Uh, JD, welcome to the Drag Community. Amesy, thank you for that super chat. Jeffrey, thank you for that super chat. Thea, great awakening. Thank you for that super chat. Sparky says, Putin's an anti-globalist hero. Petro ruble rules. Yeah, well, you know, I, I what, think what, what is she going to do in Saudi Arabia? Well, what is she going to do in Saudi Arabia? I'm going to say what he's going to do. First of all, we've had a big deal done by the Saudis and the Chinese over oil. So, you know, Saudi Arabia will be supplying China with oil and there's going to be lots of uh, mutual work there. You know, the Chinese importing Russian oil, but they're also going to be importing uh, Saudi oil. But I think the purpose of C's visit is to prepare for Saudi Arabia's admission into the BRICS. I think that's really what it's all Big about. And, and, you know, bear in mind this. The BRICS are heading towards creating this reserve currency based on a basket of BRICS currencies. If Saudi Arabia is a member of the BRICS, then they will demand payment in that BRICS currency for their oil. I mean, it's logical. At what which does point, the US do? What does the US do? Petro, petrodollar. Saudi Arabia. Rates. Oh, what Saudi, do you do well, Saudi Arabia to prevent well, this? Well, I mean, well, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, because, you know, because the U.S. has been deeply embedded in Saudi Arabia for a long time. They'll be talking to all their friends amongst the princes. You never know what they could do. Saudi Arabia could become very much a place to watch. But the U.S. has to be careful, has to be very careful what it does. Because, first of all, uh, MBS may be pretty deeply entrenched in Saudi Arabia now. He's increasingly looking as if he is. And of course, if you move against him too obviously and destabilize Saudi Arabia, well, there's some really frightening people in Saudi Arabia, you know, on the, on the sides. And that could create even more problems. Anyway, we'll see. But I, I, I mean, for the moment, the drift is for Saudi Arabia to join the BRICS. And I think that is why C is going there. It's just, these are such huge moves. Absolutely, yeah. You know, that that when you look at what what the uh, what the BBC or what CNN is reporting, it's just, they're not reporting any of this. No, I know. Well, I know. Well, you remember, you remember Biden went to Saudi Arabia, a huge amount of coverage of that, and came up, came back with nothing. He got nothing from the Saudis. And then a, a, a day or so later, MBS is on the phone to Putin, having incredibly friendly chat. And now Xi Jinping is going to, to Saudi Arabia. And again, it's not being reported. Yeah. I don't know. A BRICS with Russia, China, Saudi Arabia, India, Iran, Iran. possibly yeah. Turkey. Possibly Turkey. South yeah. Africa. I mean, Brazil. Mm. Anyway. Well, I know. Well, I mean, exactly. Well, I mean, you know, Blinken went to South Africa. What came of that? <laughs> I mean, what was the what was the end result of that? What what did that achieve? He, he was made a fool. He was made a fool. Of, exactly. He, yeah, he was made a fool. Yeah. yeah exactly. Absolutely. And good for South Africa. They they and told Blinken South. how it is. I mean, I know. Straight up. <laughs> anyway, uh, Jeff, thank you for that super sticker. LK, thank you for that super stack super chat. Elza, thank you for that super chat. Uh, Apple Bista, thank you for that super sticker. Elza says, Alex, you said you are just two guys that sell t-shirts. 
who believes that the Duran has only great t-shirts? I have a bridge to sell you. <laughs> ah, thank you, Elsa, very much. We do sell t-shirts. This is my, this is my Canada t -shirts. Uh, shirt that I'm wearing today, Alexander. Yeah, I've got my I've got my sweatshirt on as well, which has got the American thing there because I still have those feelings for the US, which some people comment about. But you know, I have them, and I don't apologize for them. Good. Uh, Jamal, thank you for that super sticker. Tempest, thank you for that super chat. Zariel says, I recommend Spectre as its own, as it's shown a perfect picture since years. No one thought it could be true, but it is saying so since 2014, but con mm. since 2014, but conspiracy. Thank you, Zariel. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, Spectre, well, yeah, James, James exactly. Bond Spectre? I think I think it's the James Bond must be the James yeah. Bond film, you know. So, yeah. But was it was an interesting film, by the way. But very good, very good. Not my favorite of the recent Bond films, but pretty good all the same. I thought the one before Skyfall was better, and yeah. I'll just say very briefly why. Because the people who made it were clearly trying to return to James Bond's nineteen sixties roots. I mean, you know, he has the old. Uh, the old car, he uh, he goes away from the MI6 office to the old Whitehall building, the sort of ambience changes. And, you know, note the old M is a woman, the new M is a man. Let's go back and attempt to return to the 60s. But they didn't quite achieve it with Spectre. With Spectre, there was... It got mixed up again. But nonetheless, Spectre did have, you know, a lot of the sinister things that's going on with the surveillance states that we have today. Yeah. And then they got rid of him. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, but I'm sure everyone yeah. knows by now. Uh, Sparky yeah. says, uh, Ocox, thank you for that super chat. Uh, Sparky mm. says, Putin's leadership is setting an example, an economic example, will influence Global South to go from corruption-based economic models to deals a deal and contracts a contract, et cetera, yeah, economic stability models. Well, absolutely. I, mean, I gather that there was, now I haven't seen this and I can't confirm this, but there's there's reports floating around that one of the uh, people on the Bundestag, one of the chairs of one of the Bundestag committees says, you know, what idiot thinks that you can tear up contracts with the Russians <laughs> and that uh, the Russians will then perform their side of the contracts anyway. I mean, you know, contracts are, you know, performance requires both parties. I mean, it's elementary. And um, economic life depends on contracts, performance of proper performance of contracts. Yep. Zook Zooksi, thank you for that super chat. RC says, as liberal globalism dies internationally and domestically, U.S., yeah. what does this mean for the future? What will the U.S. look like in five to ten years? Well, I hope it will be a liberating thing for the U.S. If this globalist project collapses, the U.S. can start to become the U.S. again. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I, you know, I know people again uh, um, get annoyed with me sometimes when I say things like that, um, and and say, well, you know, the U.S. in the past wasn't, you know, you know the ideal place that I imagined it was. I never have imagined that it was an ideal place, but it had a lot going for it. And frankly, I think if this globalist project is gone, that it will have a lot going for it again. That's what I believe. It'll be free. It'll be free, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Amesy says, please name and shame the Australian government. You never talk about what happens here and the effects the U.S. or the, no. U the EU or the U.S. don't represent us. You are absolutely right. We give far little attention, far too little attention to Australia. And we should we always say that we're going to try to focus on Australia more and then events overwhelm us and we don't quite do it. But we should really make an effort. Yesterday, over the over my live stream, the, my local live, live stream, I was asked to give some advice to the Australian government. And I suggested three things. First, that they bring us, they get Assange to Australia, that they come out clearly against this extradition, against the charges that have been brought against him in the United States, that they bring him to Australia, that they defend and protect an Australian citizen 
who has done entirely the right thing, who is, in my opinion, the outstanding uh, investigative, investigative journalist of our age. And Australia should be proud of him and they should defend him. That's one thing they should do. The second thing they should do is that they should end this AUKUS arrangement. Now, I, you know, I'm not uh, uh, saying that they should break their friendship alliance with the United States, but AUKUS is a trap. It's it's not going to work out in America's in Australia's interests. Not going to work out in America's interests either. But Australia needs to get out of that. And the third thing they need to do is they need to stop this lockdown policy that they landed themselves in. And I hope that's in the past and that it never returns. I'm going to be very careful what I say about the last because you well you know that our friends don't like me talking too much, don't like us talking too much about that. But that's the advice I would give to Australia. I was asked to give advice. Obviously, no one from the Australian government is going to pay any attention. They don't listen to, to us anyway. But I, I, I said those three things and I say them still. Yeah. Unfortunately, no one in, Austra in the Australian government is, is going to be watching this, uh, this no. live stream. And if they are watching this live stream, they, they're going to probably just... You know, call us. Well, they'll do the op shields, they'll do the op they'll be, they'll yeah, do the op yeah. they'll be, they'll do the opposite of all the things. They'll do the opposite. Exactly. We've just said, and of course, I believe that's going to get Australia, you know, a wonderful country, into an ever worse place. Yeah, they need to bring back Assange, though. You have to start there. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Uh, Rafik Adams says, do you think neocons and globalists will lose power in the West finally as a result of Putin's pushback in Ukraine? Well, I think they will eventually lose power in the West because their project is, as I've said so many times, an impossible one. It's a utopian one. Now, whether Putin is going to do this, he's not going to do this single handed. I mean, you know, no human being, no country by itself can do it. But Certainly, this conflict in Ukraine is one of the um, events that is going to lead to the failure of this project. Yeah. Um, RC says, will the current recession in the U.S. be worse than in 2008? If so, what is the best period to correlate it to? I think it may be because, to be straightforward about it, the response from the administration is going to be so much worse. I mean, Alex talked about the anti-inflation package, hopelessly misnamed, in my opinion, as essentially a slush fund. And that is what it is. I don't think this administration has any idea how to deal with an in, with a economic recession. I mean, Obama's, I mean, he had a, he, 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 he looks amazingly well organized by comparison. Yeah. And let's face it, Obama was no, you know, Roosevelt or JFK or Reagan or anything like that. So Tish M says, no matter the consequences to maintain control of global resources, that was from Mike Pompeo this June at the Hudson Institute. None non-elected policymakers are gonna get us all killed. Your thoughts? Well, absolutely. And what's what's happened in Ukraine? Fermenting a war there has resulted in Russia gaining control <laughs> of more resources. There was a study which was done recently, which said, you know, already Russia controls most of the gas, <laughs> the oil, the, the rare metals, the rare earths in Ukraine. They've already gained control of much of the black earth zone, which produces the rich harvests. So, you know, these wars, don't result in the U.S. gaining control of resources. It results in the U.S. expending treasure, blood of its own people, and the goodwill of the world. These neocon projects are disastrous for the U.S. Yeah, summer of 1970 says Ukraine just got a shipment of Daisy BB guns. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that, summer of 1969. Zuxi says, cool mod squad. Thank you for that. Uh, Johan mm. says support from the Netherlands. Thank you, Johan. Mm. Uh, Ames, he says people in Australia have been taught in the last 10 years to hate China, even though they bailed us out, as did Russia. Kevin Rudd, mm. our ex-PM. Mm. Yeah. 
a yeah, I mean, I, 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 yep. yeah, I'll agree with that. I mean, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we we shouldn't we shouldn't be taught to hate people. I mean, you can criticize them, I and mean, there's lots of things you can find China and Russia that you can disapprove of. But you know, hate and loathing is just something one should put to one side. It it all it does is it blinds people and clouds their judgment and makes them do bad things. Pago the Lesser, thank you for that super chat. Colin Jones, thank you for that super sticker. Liana says, hello from Russia. Arrived here two weeks ago. Promised update. Yes, travel is challenging, but possible. London, Istanbul, Moscow, Siberia. Moscow wow. was as vibrant as ever. Shelves are full. Many Western brand shops still open. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Liana, for story. that update. Um, a, a friend of my, a friend of mine who runs a business in Moscow and who is, by the way, not Russian. I don't want to say more. Uh, um, told me that many of the so-called many of the Western brands which have pulled out, what they've really done, is that they've transferred their assets to a local franchise holder, but they're still quietly working with that franchise holder. To keep the to keep the thing yeah. running, so, and she she she's somebody who would know about these things. Hmm. Roy Wilkinson says, assuming the Western people can get rid of our globalist class, how can our Western economies fit constructively into the new fair world order? We will find a way. We have the resources to do it. We can do it. I mean, you know, never give way to despair. We would have a huge amount of work to do to rebuild our economies and societies. But by the way, the very act of doing that is we'll, we'll, we'll strengthen our morale. If we're actually doing things which are practical and constructive in our own societies, our societies will start to feel better about themselves, even if it takes us a long time to get to the point where we need to be. Commander Crossfire says, I was disappointed to learn the reports of North Korean volunteers heading to Ukraine was fake news. I do hope Russia and North Korea would develop relations. I, I think, well, I'm sure they will. I mean, I think one thing will probably happen is that we will, we may see North Korean construction workers in Donbass. I mean, there's apparently, that apparently is a real possibility. And they're apparently very, North Koreans are very good at that apparently. But uh, soldiers, fighters in from North Korea, in Donbass, in the war, I don't think we'll see. In fact, I'm sure we won't see. Reza says, you are both brilliant and truly appreciated your hard work and dedication every single day. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much, yeah. Reza, for that amazing super chat. Uh, Rafik Adams says, given the, the irrational behavior of the neocons, wouldn't Ukrainians be better off under Russian hegemony than under predatory globalist control as autonomous state within the Russian Federation. Well, can I just say, I mean, this is not, this is not the outcome I wanted at the start of this. I mean, or, 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 you know, when, when Ukraine became independent, I wished it well. I wanted to see the Minsk agreement implemented. I wanted to see a, a, a Ukraine, which had a real aspiration towards independence. I wanted to see it succeed, but the fact is, its failure is becoming worse with every passing day, partly because its so-called Western friends are compounding that failure. And one gets reports now of people driving to Zaporozhye, to Russian control regions uh, like Zaporozhye, to escape Ukraine. And you see pictures now of cars, you know, with people with all their um, belongings. They're moving now into these regions. So what you what you spoke about, it would it's not, as I said, the outcome I would have wanted, but it may very well be what we will get. Yeah. Ronald B says Putin gave a speech against globalism and favoring the ability of individual countries to choose their own path. But Russia has intervened in Belorussia, Georgia, Chechnya, Syria, and Ukraine. How would Putin distinguish globalism with Russia's involvement in the affairs of neighboring countries? Well, I, I think you're going to have to take those countries one by one, Alexander, because well, Georgia, Chechnya, Syria, Belarusia. I don't. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say they well, intervened. They were invited, but and, and well, Georgia I mean, well, uh, is also 
has been misinterpreted yeah. a lot. Well, it, well anyway, well, I mean, yeah. you can, you can, well, first of all, Chechnya is, uh, uh, you know, a part of the Russian Federation. And bear in mind, Chechen troops uh, are now, you know, the spearhead of the Russian forces in Ukraine. So already, obviously, that is a different story. I mean, you know, that, that's a, that that's different from what you said. But Belarus, Kazakhstan, um, and Syria, they were invited there by the governments of those countries. I mean, this is the official governments of those countries said we wanted help from Russia. Belarus, Belarus has treaty arrangements with Russia. By the way, Russian involvement in the defeat of the protests, the protest movement was very limited. The Russians, Russian military, Russian security forces were not directly involved. They gave a certain amount of moral support. They gave an awful lot of intelligence support. They gave, of course, economic support. But they didn't meddle in the way that Western governments meddle. And meddle also in Belarus as well, remember. Oh, it was a coup. It was a coup attempt. It was, a coup. it was an attempted coup, exactly. Georgia, if you're talking about 2008 in Georgia, the European Union itself accepted that Georgia attacked South Ossetia, a breakaway region of Georgia, but there was a ceasefire. There was a UN Security Council resolution regulating that ceasefire. There was a Russian peacekeeping force in South Ossetia authorized to be there. As a result of that UN Security Council resolution, Georgia disregarded all of that. They launched an attack on South Ossetia. They were defeated and I think most people who look at that would agree that that was done according to international law. So I think Georgia is completely different. And if you're talking about Ukraine, well, this is a very complex and involved story. But again, the event that led to the crisis in Ukraine is the failure by Ukraine and the Western powers to implement the Minsk Agreement, which also is... Uh, um, confirmed by a Security Council resolution and is therefore a part of international law and of which Russia is a guarantor. So I think that these examples that you cite don't really invalidate the points that Putin was making. Uh, Apogel the Lesser says, there's a very good reason why Gorbachev will not show his face in Russia today, why the Russians haven't tracked him down and charged him with treason is beyond me. Well, there's lots of reasons why the Russians wouldn't want to track him. I mean, the, the, the Russian authorities do not want to reopen the wounds left over from that period in the 1990s. And you're quite right in saying that Gorbachev is deeply unpopular in Russia. He's associated with the events of the 1980s and the 1990s, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the collapse of Russian society during that time. He's deeply unpopular. But I, I suspect it would be difficult to put together a legal case against him. And secondly, putting him on trial would be an enormously radical move and one which I'm not convinced Russian society would welcome. Yeah. Uh... Trash Hubante says, freedom is nothing else to lose. Chris Christopherson. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, Amesy says, look into the Darwin uh, Port China leased to help Australians, a military base now being corrupted by neocons. Believe it or not, we live on the planet too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, yes. thank you for that. Uh, Raul says, German official trashers, cost of living protesters as enemies of the state. Your thoughts? Well, I think this is increasingly uh, worrying. I mean, I, I have to say, I, I found some of the sort of wild language that we're getting out of some people in Germany about, from some officials in Germany about, you know, protests and things like that. It looks to me like preparation for some kind of clampdown when, you know, if, if, if protests come. People should remember that protests are a human right. The right. There is a right to protest. And if people are being pushed to the economic brink, as they are in Britain and will before long be in Germany too, 
then protests become inevitable. If protests are carried out in a legal way and in a peaceful way, then as I said, they are a human right. And um, clampdowns on those kind of protests are utterly wrong. Uh Tegisi says, wouldn't China actually benefit from globalization given access to global markets? Indeed, the Chinese, of course, have at various times set themselves up as the great champions of globalization. But of course, it's globalization for export only because China doesn't apply its uh, nostrums, its mechanisms internally within China itself. I mean, they've, they've as you correctly said, uh, used globalization to build their mighty export machine and their mighty industrial base. And, you know, let's not criticize them. Every country should make the most of its opportunities. If people have been willing to open their doors to Chinese imports, why wouldn't the Chinese take advantage of that? But yeah. when the Chinese talk about globalization, they mean it in exactly the narrow way that you said. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, from Wally Estate, thank you for that super sticker. From Set Setengo, great work, ANA. Thank you for that super chat. Pago the Lesser mm -hmm. says, add this special military, after this special military operation, Russia should consider reconstitution of the USS. No, I don't think that's what they're going to do. I think that uh, from a Russian point of view, that would probably be a backward step. And I, I've actually seen Russian officials saying that, you know, a, a re reconstitution re of the old union would not only be a retrograde step for Russia, but it would bring back under Moscow's control large populations that do not want to be under Moscow's control and just don't have any affinity with the core population, which is Russian. So they want to keep, they want to make sure that whatever territory they control is one that wants to be part of them. But what they will do, I think, and what, and what I think is now inevitable, is we're going to see a very significantly expanded Russia bringing together the Eastern Slav lands. And that didn't need to happen you know, from a Western point of view, they could have found ways to work with Russia that would have prevented that. But that's what they're going to get. Yeah. And uh, Pago the Lesser says the Union of Sovereign States, gentlemen, the USS. OK. Yeah. Uh, okay, Mark, Mark Hewitt. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, Mark Hewitt says. I mean, remember, there is. Yeah. Can I just just add? I mean, the, remember, there is the Eurasian Economic Union, which uh, plays an in economic integrative role and which will no doubt continue to evolve. But I don't think that they will want to create a political superstructure on top of it for the reasons Mark, I said. Yeah. Mark Hewitt says, in terms of 2024, are there gubernatorial elections in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin just as important as, as the races for the House? Absolutely correct. That's entirely true. Um, I don't have the granular understanding of this that some people in the U.S. do, but no doubt we'll be covering it extensively and we'll be drawing on the expertise of people like Robert Barnes to discuss this, you know, thoroughly. Yeah. Uh, Lada Moreau says the world indeed needs multipolarity, not some WEFBS or USEU hegemony. Absolutely agree with that. Thank you for that. Lana Sanjeva, one of two uh, comments. The racism of EU politicians reminds me of that timely poem from the Lutheran pastor, Michael Niemöller, first they came for uh, blank in the super chat. I am ashamed I didn't say anything when Iraq was sanctioned, when they bombed Yugoslavia, and part two says mm. when they ruined Libya, when they blockaded mm. Cuba and Venezuela because I didn't come from those countries. One day they banned me from visiting Europe and there won't be anybody to speak for me. Absolutely correct. That's entirely true. By the way, it's an extraordinary poem by Niemöller. And if you go to Germany, I mean, you'll find all the monuments and way, the way he's remembered. And he was a heroic man who stood up against the um, Th Third Reich re regime. And it's a tragedy that the lessons he tried to impart have been forgotten. Because one of the things that he stood for, as that poem shows, is um, empathy for all human beings. Hmm. 
uh, cynical e hopeful says since all our institutions and media are russophobic what do you think is the best way to show people Russia isn't an evil state they make it out to be how do we get people to take the Russia pill I think eventually events will have to do it I don't think anything else will because you know we can all argue and you know we have to argue we mustn't you know give up on this but I've increasingly come to the view that um it'll be events the, the you know the tide of events that eventually force people to address their own prejudices and see the disaster to which it's led them into which it's, those prejudices have led them yeah gabriel says as a marine corps vet and a russian orthodox christian i appreciate the analysis of alex alexander god bless you all and grant you many years thank you very much you, we're very thank grateful you. for that yeah Amesy says, Putin gets me through the day. My parents were born in the camps. I honor them. Again, I ask you to speak not just for Europe, but us displaced. Yeah, absolutely. Well, but, you know, we don't, uh, we, we hope we don't just speak for Europe. Obviously, we are both grounded in Europe. But, you know, we, 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 we do look, try to look beyond. I mean, we always say our double-headed eagle. It's not the Russian double-headed eagle or the Byzantine double-headed eagle. It's we, it's we try, we try to look across the whole world. And of course, I don't pretend that we will succeed and our areas of expertise tend to you know, reduce in other places, but that's what we aspire to. Commander Crossfire says, Slava Ukraine, soon the occupying enemy will be thrown back and destroyed. Ukraine will be freed and returned to its right, rightful place, one with the motherland, Russia. <laughs> Thank you, Commander Crossfire, for that. Tyler Durden, thank you for that super chat. Paul, thank you for that super chat. Cynical E. Hopeful says, do we still have Western civilization or have we become the American globalist empire? Well, uh, let's take away the word American because America is part of Western civilization. We have become part of the globalist empire. Talk about civilization. Look, just look at the condition of the arts today. Look at Hollywood and what it produces, the film industry. Look at the uh, visual arts. Look at architecture. I mean, we are in a very debased condition. And why is that so? Because we've turned away, in my opinion, from our cultural roots. Yes. Uh, from um, Peter Abel. Thank you for that super sticker from Commando Crossfire. The Kherson offensive failed because the West, US, UK, US failed to fully appreciate the scale of Russia's reserves and the strength of their resolve. Absolutely correct. Entirely true. I would add, by the way, that I always got the impression I, and I've increasingly got the impression that the Kherson offensive was was invented in London. <laughs> I don't think anybody in Kiev. Um, initially, really seriously, t t took the idea seriously. But the British were very keen on it. They've been pushing this on the Ukrainians relentlessly. And of course, the point has now been reached when even the British have come to realize it simply can't, it simply won't run. Uh, Colberry, thank you for that super sticker. Daniela, thank you for that super sticker. Amesy says, Alex, I cried with joy and sadness when you were in Belgrade. I'm proud of my people, but the loss from the us from the A A U S T A S E. Us are you are you tasty? I'm okay. not sure I get the last part, but th thank you, AMC, for for yeah. that. Uh, M Zoo says question. Thanks for your great analysis. What do you think about the comments from Poland's central bank president about Germany trying to take back land from Poland? Can't it be some preparation for a takeover of land in Ukraine? Yeah, I think I think that's exactly what it is. I think this is exactly what it's preparing for. And it suggests to me, by the way, that there's arguments about this behind the scenes between Germany and Poland and with some people in Germany telling Poland not to do it and some people in Poland pushing back. And I think this is partly what this is all about. And it's interesting to see Poland and Germany, the, the, the tensions there, which have clearly always festered, they're starting to grow again. It's difficult to know quite what to think of this in its entirety because, and now I have my contacts in Germany. I do think there are many, many people in Germany who seriously entertain those ideas. So mm. I, I don't think it's about that. I do think it's about Ukraine. Yeah. 
limiting factor says, what's going to happen to the world economy when China goes for Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, all I will say about it is this. If this situation with Taiwan isn't resolved in a peaceful and orderly way, and we get a crisis over Taiwan and a sanctions crisis, then the economic disruptions caused by the sanctions war against Russia is going to look like a roadside picnic by comparison with what will come. I mean, yeah. we're not talking about recession or depression. We're talking about something on an altogether bigger scale. Yeah. Ames, he says, it's worth the $5 to hear Alexander laugh. He makes me smile. Thanks. Thank you for that, Amesy. Nikki uh, Ball says, will Pakistan and Khan find a way to join BRICS? Could it be that India and China would help? Well, that's a very good question, actually, because one wonders what India would think. I, I'm going to suggest, again, a, a, any Indian person following, I know a lot of people in India do. I think it would be in India's interests for Pakistan to join the BRICS. And the reason I think that is because it would provide India and Pakistan with a venue, a platform, where they could finally have a sustained dialogue with each other, which is, I think, what's been missing. Because these two countries, for very good historic reasons, which I'm not going to discuss, have been locked into this intense adversarial relationship. They're able to have this venue, this mechanism to talk they might start to find a way through. So I think India's interests are served by Pakistan joining the BRICS. And, well, we'll see where that happens. If Pakistan and India can sort out their problems, perhaps India and China can begin to do so as well. Harry C. Smith says, I started calling Elensky Captain T-shirt, then noticed he literally wears brown shirts. So which is better, yeah. Captain T-shirt or Captain Brown shirt? <laughs> I'm, well I'm not going to say. <laughs> yeah, well said. Uh, Raul says, Farmer's Almanac is predicting a very cold winter in North America. Hope Europe is paying attention. Either bow to Putin or end to their democracies. Yes, I know. I, I, I've, I've noticed that too. Um, well, we'll see. I think they are paying attention. The question is, what are they going to do? I, I'm going to say this. I mean, you're talking about reopening Nord Stream 2, um, which it seems to me is an obvious thing to do, and starting negotiations with the Russians, which I think you also need to do. Be aware that if, if any of that happens, the present government in Germany can't survive. I mean, it, it, it would be so discredited. Get, get rid of the Greeks. That, but I mean, you know, but we are asking for a major political change in Germany, a country which is designed to avoid that. I mean, the whole political and constitutional system makes it very difficult to change a government in Germany once it's established. It can be done. It has been done in the past. But at the moment, you know, it's 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 not easy. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Uh, Pickwick, thank you for joining the Durant community. Ruggiero says, how much of a tinfoil hat scenario is it to speculate that Putin is just playing a role to destabilize the world, to facilitate the Great Reset, and finally usher in the globalist world order? I don't think so. I mean, you know, I, I think for Putin to do that, I mean, first of all, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, we're not talking about four or five or six dimensional chess. I mean, this is even more, this would be something even beyond that. Secondly, I mean, you know, why would Putin do all that to himself? <laughs> why would he expose himself to all this, you know, extraordinary abuse and vilification? by by doing all of that what what's in it for him at the end of the day i i mean i i can't see it surely if he's a globalist if he really was a globalist he'd be going along with klaus schwab and all of that crowd and you know he'd still be invited to all the uh, you know parties in davos and all the rest and that seems to me 
more consistent with what you would expect from him if he was a globalist. I mean, they vilify him so, so bad Absolutely. and on such a consistent Absolutely. basis. It's, yes. it's just not. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. Uh, Liana says, update two, consensus from Russia, people from Russian people I spoke, is they feel terrible for regular Ukrainian people and blame Zelensky and the U.S. for all this, but feel no other way to stop the killings in Donbass. No hate for Ukraine. I, 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 that's entirely what I'm getting as well. And by the way, I should say, you know, I read Russian Telegram channels. I have to. I also try and keep up to date with what Ukrainians are saying. But I, I, again, I don't get the sense of any real hate in Russia towards Ukraine. In fact, none at all. Yeah. Uh, Rubina says, Australia bombshell, XPM Morrison held a secret shadow cabinet of five portfolios. The country is disgusted. Yeah, well, Morrison. Thank you for that. Jungle Jin says, why phase out nuclear power? No one would ever bomb or shell stations, nor would they ever succumb to natural catastrophes like tsunamis. Well, there you go. Yeah. I Andrew, mean, uh, a, a very good point, by the way. But I mean, it, it's the shelling, which is the really astonishing thing, it seems to me. Yeah. Jennifer Chang that says, wish everyone with a, with a snowman so hot everywhere. And a snow, a snowman emojis. Mm. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for that. Awesome. Super chat. Angry Warhawk says, will Argentina make a move on the Falklands? Not for the moment. I think I think that in Argentina, apparently they're going through an, another of their economic crises. And I think that's probably the main focus of attention. I don't think they'll make a move on the Falklands. Uh, Asmi says, I found it noteworthy at, that at no point did Putin or Shoigu blame ordinary Westerners in all of this. They were aimed squarely at elites. Absolutely correct. That's entirely right. They've been very careful not to. I mean, contrast that with proposals for, you know, Schengen bans on visas for Russians, blanket bans for Russians. And I mean, you know, it, it, there is a sharp difference in rhetoric between the Russians and the West. Just as Russians don't blame Ukrainians, Russians are not hostile to Westerners. Though perhaps it's surprising, given the things that are said about Russians by Westerners. But anyway, they, they tend not to be, and certainly the leaders are not. Whereas the things we say about Russians in the West, I have to say, I, I'm both dismayed by they're far worse than anything I'd expected and ashamed of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Researcher says Bill Gates visited South Korea recently, apparently to beg for donations to his Bill and Melinda fund, another money laundering operation, another yeah. Zellywood type medicine monkey. Oh, goodness. Well, yeah, I'm sure. Yep. Bill Gates. Uh, Doc. Do it your own way, says, I am always on the lookout for your programs, be it the Duran or Alexander Mercurius. Both of you are the best analysts. I wish Russia to win this war, yet I always want the war will end soon. Yes, so do I. So do we. I mean, I, I, I'm going to say this again, and I speak for both of us here. We, The one thing we would say about this war is that neither of us wanted it. Both of us hate it. And we, we absolutely hate it. We want to see it end soon. Um, I don't think it will end soon diplomatically, but I don't think it's going to continue for as long as many people think, because I think we are now, as I said, at that tipping point. And over the next few weeks, it'll become clear who's going to win it militarily. Yeah. Uh, Pickwick, thank you for that super sticker. Jungle Jim says, is Valesa the Polish version of Joe the Plumber? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm... Not able to say which <laughs> Valesa is. Yeah, um, Anya. Anya and, could tell us probably. And, we should uh, have an, and, we should have another program with Anya. Soon, yes, right? we should definitely have Anya on yeah. soon. Uh, Anthony uh, Sadic says greetings from Perth, Western Australia. Also greetings for from all Croatians around the world. Love your work. Love your passion for Greece. Can't wait to visit. Abs absolutely. Can I just say? I mean, Croatia is another place I've been to, and it's. Uh, the Dalmatian coast is one of the most beautiful places in the world. And Zagreb is a fine city. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Elena, thank you for that super sticker. Orlando Santos says, Dis distressing uh, the poverty of our mass media. Great work, guys. A wind of mostly accurate information is much appreciated. Thank, thank you for you. that. Uh, Marcelo says, Bolsonaro in recent interviews said, quote, age has not been kind to Biden, end quote, when asked about relations with the USA. Brazil's BRICS position is above ideology. Yeah, absolutely. Can I just say something about Bolsonaro? I mean, he's the one world leader who I think has come out and actually straightforwardly said that. Putin has said things which hint about, hint on that very point. But Bolsonaro is about the one person who just says it, as we all see it. Yeah. Uh, Mari says, I remember watching the original Goldfinger as, bo as boarding school, a magical moment. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the early the early Sean Connery films are just amazing. Uh, I mean, they really are. I mean, they 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 are they are brilliant cinema. And remember, in Fleming was as alive still when they when they first started. Mm -hmm. mm. Zariel says, "What will this mean if BRICS creates a new currency? So it will be another global currency conglomerate. That's exactly what we don't want. Get me." Well, I do absolutely get you. And can I just say this? I mean, that's for the future. That's a problem for the future. I mean, you know, I'm no, not a naive person. There is a possibility that we could just exchange one global system for another. But at the moment, we have to deal with the global system that we have. And at the moment, the Russians are saying what they're saying, that they defend sovereign rights. Uh, Sharia says, why was Russia able to raise interest rates to 20% to tame inflation, by the same, but the same cannot be done by Western economies? Can China do something like that? I don't know about China. I think it will be difficult for the Chinese to do. And in fact, they've, they've cut interest rates rather than increase them. The reason Russia can't raise interest rates, obviously, is because they've kept their debt situation low. Well under control exactly exactly um jahangir says india and pakistan cannot be friends pakistan is driven by the likes of taliban who have no other objectives other than the cultural genocide of the majority of indians hindus who face the same propaganda as russia do as russians do by the west yes i didn't say become friends what i said is establish a functional dialogue with each other friends would take a very very long time to happen between Pakistan and India. All I am saying is, from an Indian point of view, having an international venue where they can talk to Pakistan and they're going to various countries there, countries like Russia, which is sympathetic to India, for example, countries like China, which may be sympathetic to Pakistan, but which will probably not want to see a crisis in, this, in the Indian subcontinent. I think that would be useful to India, especially given that in a venue like the BRICS, India, being by far the more powerful country, would ultimately carry the more weight. Hmm. From uh, Liana, when listening to either of you speak, I find myself finishing your sentences before you say the exact words I say. Either I watch way too many of your shows or it's some high level telepathy. Well, I think at some point you must join us on our programs. Yeah. <laughs> <It's>, uh, clearly, <laughs> clearly, 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 you are somebody who is able to. Uh, compliment our ideas uh, wonderfully. Thank you very much for that. Super Chat Danitza says, what would be the consequences if an EU country does not follow the rules imposed by the European Commission? Are sanctions possible to be imposed on an EU country? Yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Hungary. Of course they Hungary. are. Look what they did to absolutely. Hungary. They've Poland. already done that. I mean, they're sanctioning, they their, money. Own they're yeah. sanctioning their own citizens. Mm -hmm. I mean, right, Britain isn't in the EU, but they've just done that to Graham Phillips. And the Germans are now doing it too. So why shouldn't they sanction one of their own member states? Yeah. I mean, this is this is exactly the kind of thing they do. They're doing it to Hungary. They'll, they threaten to do it to all sorts of others. Of course they Absolutely. will do it. Absolutely. Mm. <laughs> they went into Cypriot banks and took the money. Oh, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Mark Hewitt says, who do you think the anti-Trump candidate for 2024 will be? Cheney, Pence or Pompeo? Maybe all three. Mm. Maybe all three, indeed, absolutely. Um, my own personal view, by the way, is an anti-Trump rhino candidate 
is only going to draw support away from the Democrats. <laughs> that's all. That's all he's that all that that sort of person will do. But that that's my own view anyway. Susan, welcome to the Drag community. Uh, Matre Putra, thank you for that super sticker. Tricky Vicky says, question, the best link to hear the full Putin and his general speeches at Armament Expo in English. Uh, them right, too well, has mostly propaganda videos, not accurate reports. Yes, I mean, I, 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 I don't know whether you can see a video of this, but um, you can read the complete transcript on the Kremlin's website. Uh, just just write President of Russia and it, on you know, on Google and it will take you there. Yeah. Rafik says, what is the possibility that Putin will decide that the entirety of Ukraine must be conquered or liberated in order to protect both Russians and ethnic Ukrainians from self-destruction? I think it is becoming more likely by the day. I'm not sure that's the decision which has been made yet. But with every day that passes and that the war is continued... I think the prospects of that grow. I don't think that was the plan at the beginning. Mm. Uh, Chris Music says, why US? Thank you, Chris, for that. Uh, Katia, thank you for that super sticker. Um, Michael says, UK, over 400,000 sign up for Enough is Enough, going to cut out Sir Keir and the chicken coop gang globalists in labor. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... Um, <laughs> Keir Starmer is such an obvious establishment, Remain uh, globalist figure, Blairite figure. I mean, it's astonishing in some ways that we, it's taken so long for uh, these kind of petitions to be put together. I mean, I, I have to say, I am very depressed about my country, about Britain. I say my country because this is where I live and I hold its citizenship. And, you know, I have a very strong connection to Britain, a very uh, strong sentimental and emotional connection to Britain. But I've never known things to be so bad. Economically, they're, they're awful, as bad as they've ever been in my lifetime, perhaps worse. But what is absolutely terrible is the political situation. We have a political class that is exhausted, um, is completely out of ideas, but instead of stepping aside, it just clings on. And it's a real disaster. Rafik Adams says, given the irrational behavior of the neocons, wouldn't Ukrainians be better off under Russian hegemony than under predatory globalist control? I think more and more Ukrainians probably quietly are coming to that view. If, those, if, the, if that film, that, those films, plural, that I've seen of Ukrainians moving to Russian-controlled areas are representative of general Ukrainian feeling, which I suspect they are. Uh, Alberta, thank you for that super chat. Budweiser, thank you for that super sticker. Benedict says, will someone tell Elensky that Steiner wasn't able to organize his men and will not come to push the Russians out? This, re this relates to a notorious incident at the very end of the Second World War when the leader of Germany, whose name I'm not going to make, not because I don't want to, but because YouTube gets nervous when one mentions him. Uh, uh, um, even as the Russian army the, was closing in on Berlin, uh, um, came up with this idea of this great counteroffensive, rather like the Herson offensive. And the general who was going to lead it was a man called Steiner. And um, of course, there was no Steiner counteroffensive. By this time, Germany had run out of functioning armies. And famously, there was a scene in the bunker when the leader of Germany was told this by his remaining generals. And there was a huge tantrum from the leader. And this was the moment when he finally admitted that the war was lost. Yeah. William says, book recommendations on geopolitics. Appreciate it. I, I always come back. You want to get uh, the best ever book on geopolitics. I still think that Thucydides, his original history, is the best. I mean, he really does explain geo how politics works really well. And um, if you want to get a commentary on it, because obviously it's talking about the geopolitics of the ancient world. Geoffrey de Sancroix's book on the origins of the Peloponnesian War is brilliant. Um, there are some very, very good 
books on contemporary and not so contemporary, but reasonably modern um, international affairs. All I would say is go to books written by historians, not to books written by IR, international relations specialists. Historians write far better on geopolitics than the international relations people do. And, you know, you could go to books like A.J.P. Taylor's book on the origins of the Second World War. Lots of good books on the origins of the First World War. An outstanding book recently by Dominic Levin on Russian foreign policy in the lead up to the First World War. And there are lots and lots of others. Alberta says Pat Buchanan, after his failed presidential bid, published a book, A Republic, Not an Empire, Reclaiming America's Destiny. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I, I think it's a brilliant title as well, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Vl Vladena, thank you for that super sticker. Jackie, thank you for that super chat. Summer of 1970 says free Assange, free Assange, free Assange. Yeah. And Stewart says, why is Iran's relationship so important to Russia? Well, I think it's become more important as time has progressed. But it's the thing to say about Iran and Russia is, I mean, first of all, look at the geography. I mean, they're both big powers in Eurasia. You, Iran completes, if you like, the Central Asian build of the Eurasian system. And the other thing is, Iran is big. It's potentially rich. It's got a fairly large industrial base. It's got uh, uh, lots of economic assets. It's very rich in natural resources. It's got an extraordinary ancient history. And you're talking about Russia and Iran. They've had a very long history with each other. The Russians and the Iranians have interacted since the 17th century. They are, you know, this isn't a remote country for the Russians. People always forget that Russia is not just a European state, it's a Eurasian state as well. It's a Central Asian state. The Russians have had close diplomatic contacts with Iran going back centuries, long before any other West Europeans, any, any of the other big European states have done. Summer of 1970 says, the trouble with practical jokes is that very often they get elected. <laughs> Will Rogers. <laughs> true enough. True enough. Very true. Uh, Oz Oz says, I was just going to mention Thucydides. You inspired me to study it again. Do you consider yourselves belonging to the realist school? Yeah, absolutely. I, in my case, un, I, I, unequivocally. And I always stress uh, the opposite of realism in foreign policy is not idealism, which is what neoliberals and liberal humanitarians always imply. It is unrealism. It's being unrealistic about foreign policy. Realism about foreign policy is understanding that you know, it has to be grounded on realities. It has to, you have to accept limits on what you do. And people who won't acknowledge limits are not being idealistic. They're being unrealistic, and that is extremely dangerous. And being a realist in foreign policy doesn't mean that you throw ethics to one side. I would argue, on the contrary, that a realist, a realist foreign policy is far more grounded on ethics than these unrealistic foreign policies that we have seen pursued by the neocons and people like them, which have been so disastrous have done so much damage, have led to so many crimes, and there can be no ethical justification for any of that. RDDR says liberalism has been corrupted by imperialism. Yeah. Um, Stevan, thank you for that super sticker. Calliope, thank you for that amazing super sticker. Thank you, Calliope, for that. Um, Jacob says, what countries are promising to move to the forego to move and to forego the coming recession and downfall of the US? Well, I mean, I think the first thing to say is that we are in a global economic crisis. And so, you know, it's going to be very difficult for some countries, for many countries to disconnect. But, you know, if you're looking around the world, you see that more and more countries, more and more regions are looking for ways out which dissociate them from the West. Look at Lavrov's trip 
to the Middle East and Africa, how he was received there, and compare it with the stony reception that Blinken got when he went to the same region a short time later. Yeah. Eric, thank you for that super sticker. Uh, Ronath, welcome to, to the Durant community. Chris says China doesn't subscribe to globalism either. It's the West's demonization. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the Chinese sometimes pretend they do. But as I said, it's their, their interpretation of globalism is one which is based on self-interest. Uh, Pupius says, uh, no, super sticker from Pupius. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Denitsa says, the whole situation reminds me of a flirting couple where the one side expects the other to be a virgin while you're having a lot of bed experience. E bed experience. Every country mm -hmm. has its skeletons in its closet. Well, absolutely. Of course it does. I mean, and that's that's a thing to say. I mean, you know, no country is perfect. No country is ideal. And nobody should pretend they are. Mm -hmm. um, from uh, Ildar, this terrible EU policy against Russian people turn into Putin supporters amongst my friends. They were very anti-Putin before. Cheers from Krakow. Yeah, I agree with this. I mean, I, I have to say, I mean, I was profoundly shocked by it. And it's great to hear somebody from Krakow saying this. I, 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 now, I'm going to say this. I think that there will day, come a day when Poland and Russia will achieve a real rapprochement with each other. I mean, I believe this. I mean, I know lots of people from Poland. I know lots of people from Russia, obviously, and I, I'm confident that one day those two nations will find each other. There's a lot of history between them, lots of legitimate grievances, but that day will come and it will be a great day, a wonderful day when it happens. Shady Lady, thank you for that super sticker. Journey to the East says, Alex's clown world. Did the fortune teller tell those politicians that get rid of all the politicians and the EU will have a bright future. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you very much for that. Yep. Get rid of the politicians and these politicians and the EU will have a bright future. Uh, mm -hmm. Amesy says, um, get rid of the EU and then Europe will have a bright future. Amesy says, in Greek, please share your best quotes. You guys connect us to the present and the past. I think I'll leave that to Alex, actually. Well, He's it's a tough, my favorite probably, quotes. It's a tough one. Tough one. Yeah. Nothing comes to... No, Greek, things. Greek, I have Greek to think about isn't. It. Yes, Greek isn't really adapted for quotes, actually. Mm -hmm. And many of the many of the things that people think are Greek quotes, like you know, famous ones like "Those whom the gods destroy, they first make mad." If you actually look, you find that there are Greek origin phrases for this, but they're not as pithy as that one. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 not easy to find them. Actually. Bella says, if tensions escalate between China and Taiwan, it is already decided that Australia military will be put into fight first, according to John Landon, the former foreign diplomat, yeah. through the AUKUS agreement. Yeah, I know exactly. So, I mean, I, is this is this what China, what Australians want? Um, I mean, you know, I, 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 I think that you know, I'm not saying you know that China is not in some ways a you know country that you need to be wary of it's big it's bursting and all those things but i think at the end of the day uh, um, a more measured policy a more balanced policy would suit australia much better china's not going uh, away for one thing Moni Kasberg says, Taiwan, fascinating place, worth a deep dive, was staging platform for the U.S. Southeast Asia CIA cat adventures involved in Bay of Pigs, deep ties to mainland China because for decades, also very active Asian mafia activity. Well, I mean, you know more about it than I do. What I would say is it is a very interesting country. It is enormously productive. I mean, people talk about its, micro, its chips, for example, it makes lots of other things. It's um, enormously vibrant society. Personally, just uh, this isn't, you know, in any way. I mean, one of the things that Taiwan makes is amazing tea. I mean, you know, we hear about China tea, but Taiwanese tea is phenomenally good. So, you know, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary country, actually, and it's got huge things going for it. And I hope nobody 
thinks that because, you know, I think that these policies of creating a war over Taiwan are wrong and bad, that I don't have huge respect for what has been achieved there. Uh, Zariel says Putin was once a WEF until he saw behind the curtain. No, I think I think there may be a lot of truth to that. I mean, one of the things about Putin, of course, is that he's met all these people. He's met Klaus Schwab many times. <laughs> so, I mean, he's, he's somebody who, who, as Zarael says, he's seen it from the inside. Yeah. Uh, from Toby, correction, Taiwan is not a country, don't it? All right, not a country. Okay, I accept that. Okay, uh, it's not a country, but an island, a people, a people who live on the island. I mean, it's... Okay. It, it's achieved an awful lot. The the one thing I would say is that, of course, they also have probably the best, the best museum of Chinese art. And, of course, it was brought from the uh, Forbidden City, from the Palace Museum in Beijing. And um, if they do decide to leave China, which would be incredibly dangerous, I wonder how they will justify trying to cling on to all those artworks which belong to ultimately to the Palace Museum. I mean, the, there's a Palace Museum in China, in Beijing. There's a Palace Museum in Taipei. Will they nationalize it? Will they try to hold on to it? Just saying. Yeah. Now there's people in the chat saying uh, Taiwan is a country. Okay, so now you sparked okay, quite we'll a debate, start, Alexander. Start, oh, <laughs> big, big, okay, okay, um, okay. Com Commando Crossfire, what are your thoughts on Armenia, Azerbaijan? Yeah, this is a very dangerous situation and can i just say i've no doubt at all that well the person who's pulling all the strings here is erdogan so we had that flare up a few about a week ago and if you think that that wasn't connected with erdogan's trip to sochi and his meeting with putin then i have a bridge to sell you so it's a very dangerous situation once this war in ukraine is over i think the russians need to sort it out yeah. And I think I when know. I say sort it out, they need to come to a permanent uh, a a settlement of this thing. And uh, um, and and I, I've no doubt that Russian sentiment will demand that as well. Danielle, thank you very much for that. Super sticker. Aaron says, without Russian oil, can NATO's military function? <laughs> very good question. <laughs> you know, yeah. we're, we're getting into all sorts of complex things all the time i mean th there was a absolutely uh, weird um thing that i saw I, I mean i didn't remember the exact details but um somebody some some companies were saying that because we we we're sanctioned and we can't buy certain products because of the sanctions a western company because we can't buy certain products finished goods because of the sanctions on Russia. We have to increase our imports from Russia of Russian aluminium. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's, it contradicts their own policies in some ways. I mean, they're, they're having to import aluminium to make up for the fact that they can't import goods from somewhere else where they can't produce them because of the sanctions. I mean, it, 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 the whole thing is getting nightmarish. And I wouldn't be surprised if with oil, especially with diesel problems. Remember, military function, military vehicles function on diesel primarily. Um, mm. You know, we, we're going to have major problems keeping our military on wheels and tracks. But anyway, I mean, I don't know this for a fact, but we'll see. Sparky says, Kamala's a loose cannon. Question is, how can establishment get her to step down gracefully in order to make way for Liz Cheney? Jokes can be serious. Well, indeed, they can be very serious. And the answer is not. It, it, the, 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 the operative word is gracefully. I don't think she will go gracefully. I think she will fight every inch of the way. She's not somebody who gives me the impression that she's going to be willing to just walk away. Paul Martinson, thank you for that super chat. Life of Brian says, Taiwan is a small country in Europe. Quote Kamala Harris. <laughs> so Kamala Harris says. Um, uh, Adrian Hart says, have you seen Alexander Antix, senator for South Australia, speech to parliament about the, the disease bureaucracy? No, I haven't. Yeah. And the short answer is I haven't. 
Oz Oz says, may I recommend a book by John Agnew, Globalization and Sovereignty Beyond the Territorial Gap. It may make you rethink the traditional divide between globalization and sovereign states. Okay. Yeah. Agnew. Agnew globalization. Yes. A Alexander says, I heard that natural gas reserves are low even in the U.S. Is this true? Yeah, I believe it is true, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 also, yeah. I also heard that uh, U.S. LNG exports to Europe are now falling fast. Mm -hmm. Can't confirm. That's what I've heard. Because the U.S. needs its LNG to stay uh, Javier. Javier says coffee funds to fill your magic mugs. Thank you, Javier. Oh, yeah. Asmi06 says, have you guys seen a video? Time to move to Russia. I think it was a great troll from the Russian foreign ministry. Yes, I have seen that video. Yes. Fantastic. Alex has seen it. I have I have not, but it I've was brought it. up on it's my funny. local yeah. live stream. Yeah. yeah. Commander Crossfire says, why doesn't Russia take out the artillery shelling the NPP, the nuclear power plant? Yeah, I, I, I think the reason always is that... Um, Going back to that amnesty report, some of this artillery is based in residential areas in Nikopol. And I think that makes it complicated. Yeah. Uh, Elza says, had Canada as a topic in class, could not say serious mentioning the head of, could not stay serious mentioning the head of, head of state, was hearing that Trudeau voice you make, Alex. <laughs> oh, I know you. Yeah. It's tough to stay serious when discussing Trudeau. Uh, <laughs> you know, Alex, Alex, Alex I, this is the difference between Alex and me. Alex can laugh about this. And, you know, I wish I could. Uh, um, when I talk about Trudeau, I tend to get angry. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, you know. <laughs> for, some reason, yeah. for some reason, he particularly raises my hackles. Perhaps um, because I remember the old Canada so well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Zariel says... A camel can't be graceful. Maybe a camel can. A Kamala can't be graceful. Maybe a camel can. Thank you, Zariel, yeah. for that. Uh, Kenk Yogurt says, I'm sure you've both discussed this previously, but not on any podcasts I've heard. What's your opinion of the works of Alexander Dugan? Yeah, I, 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 read, I read one of his pieces, which was the fourth political theory. And I read it and I found it, up to a point, actually quite brilliant. I mean, the, the, the man's erudition, his knowledge is just off the scale. It's also wonderfully well written. And, you know, I was then found myself at the end feeling rather, I'm going to deny this, rather let down because I was waiting to read what this fourth political theory was. So I mean, he went through all the others, you know, liberalism, fascism, democracy, all the rest. Uh, communism and you know he was going to tell us about this fourth political theory and there never was a fourth political mm. theory at least not in this book and I have to say this is very much my own feeling about Dugan he he's very good at discussing things and coming up with ideas you don't mind always like them but I mean you know he's productive in that way but he never comes up with anything practical that's that's my own view about Dugin. His influence in Russia, I've said this so many times, is vastly overstated. And it's simply not true that the general staff, the Russian general staff, bases its curriculum, curricula, a geopolitical curricula around him. I mean, this is simply not the case. Duck Life says, ex-CIA director Michael Hayden, who authorized torture at Guantanamo Bay, tweeted, Donald Trump should be executed on the White House floor. Oh, my uh, God. I did not see that tweet. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Wow. Um, let's see. Uh, Marker says, I really, Marker 100 says, I really appreciate you guys. Thank you, Alexander. Is a whole library. Thank you very much for that amazing super chat. Marker. Gary, welcome to the Duran community. Uh, not intimidated, says, do you believe the EU will have massive citizen uprisings that could get violent if the energy issue gets worse than it is now? Yeah, I mean, it's not impossible. But can I just say this again? I, I'm very um, concerned about all this talk about violence, because I do believe and I said this, we said this earlier in the live stream, that some of these people who are talking about violent protests, especially in Germany, are people who are basically preparing a crackdown. 
And if people are in real economic distress, they will protest. Mostly people, when they protest, they protest peacefully and lawfully and in an orderly way. And certainly they would in a country like Germany. So talking about violent protests in anticipation of something like that makes me do, do does make me wonder what the agendas of some of these politicians, these German politicians who are talking in this way, what their agenda is. Um, at retarded says, do you think the US will kick Russia off the internet? Yandex browser already set up for this, by the way. Yeah, I think they will eventually. I mean, I, 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 I think we've talked about this. We talked about this long before the present crisis. Um, I think it was Alex that we're moving towards the fragmentation of the internet, the end of the World Wide Web. And I think that's, that is where we're going. And um, it's something I regret, but the pressure for it has come from the US and it built up in 2016. And given the enormous benefits the World Wide Web gave to the US, again, they have dismantled one of the sources of their own power. Uh, V-Plan, thank you for that super sticker. Natalia, thank you for that super chat. Cactus Ray, thank you for that super sticker. Nina says, I would argue that, that the opposite of realism is ideology. Neocons are ideologues worse yeah. than Soviet communists. Yeah, I, 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 I think you're absolutely correct. I mean, I don't dispute that at all. Uh, um, I, I, I agree. All I am saying is that, you know, sometimes you do come across these people who say, oh, you're a realist. So that must be you're a cynic. When he's not being cynical, we're simply being realistic. Ideologues tend not to be realistic. They don't recognize limits. And when you do away with limits, then you can do terrible things. Yeah, Euro Gabor says, if... Oh, I just lost it. Mm. One sec. Mm. If... Ay, ay, ay. Keeps on scrolling away from me, Alexander. Uh, if no, Hungary would be sanctioned by the EU, harsher than as is now, that could push the country out of the EU and NATO towards BRICS. Yeah, it might do. Um, we'll see how this works out. I mean, I, I get it. I mean, the one thing the EU combinat is good at is retaining control. So I, I think if they start sanctioning Hungary, they will do that in combination with attempts to change the political system in Hungary. <laughs> and Jürgen you know, says Orban can do it by a simple vote of parliament holding no referendum. Oh, really interesting. Oh, interesting. Thank you for that, Jürgen uh, Let's see. Lilia says, in the collective West, we are lacking leaders and parties that are taking firm stand against the current cor course. What political ideas could come up and attract the people that disagree well i think there's I, th I think the first thing that people need to focus on is recovering our democracies and as i said many times democracy the way it exists can only really function within states within state systems because if you create supranational entities then they are by definition unaccountable so um being patriotic, loving your country, resisting these uh, in, in attempts to impose a globalization system upon you is not incompatible with being a Democrat. On the contrary, I would say it is a precondition to being an effective Democrat. And when words like, you know, being pa a patriot is thrown against you and it's implied that this makes you some kind of, you know, bad person, uh, which is increasingly the case, by the way. That is a very sinister development indeed. So, you know, people should promote that fact, publicise it, build for it. And once you get your democracies back, then you can reshape your societies as the people choose them to be. And people can then start to get real choices about the directions they want to take, not to have things presented to them as they are now. Right. Hal, welcome to the drag community. Uh, Reg Scott, welcome to the drag community. GEC812 says, calling Trudeau Castro Jr. seems the reflux, seems the reflux away. 
<laughs> thank you very much for that, GEC. Uh, old music teacher chick, thank you for that $2 super chat. Uh, let's see. Amesy says, this makes me laugh. Is Tasmania not a part of Australia? Look out. Look out. We are about to invade our own nation. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, old, old Gayerus daughter. Uh, thank you for your work. Thank you very much for that super chat. Commander Crossfire says thoughts on Belarus, any chance of unity with Russia? Yes, I think so. I mean, I think if, if these events in Ukraine take their course, then as I said, the, the gravitational pull on Belarus will grow. I think a lot of people in Belarus will welcome, will welcome it. Hmm. Not everybody, but a lot of people. Right. Uh, Double Thinker says, my question is, would the Chinese issue sanctions directed at the culprits, such as Biden, Pelosi, clans, and various other British companies? Yes. I think the Chinese have shown that they're ready to do it. And I think they would do it if things really got to the point where um, the Chinese felt it advisable. At the moment, they don't, but Potentially, they could do it. And CC says the U.S. is an ATM machine masquerading as the British Empire. <laughs> Brilliant. And that is everything, Alexander. Wow. That's a brilliant live stream, actually. Yeah. Thank you to our moderators, Zarael, GEC, Spartan Warrior Queen in the house, GEC in the house, Zariel in the house, Valius, great Valius, thank you very much to all our moderators. Uh, Catherine was also moderating as well. Um, who else? I think I got all of, our, all of our moderators. Yes, I got all of them. Yes, Catherine Smith, thank you very much. Um, thank you to everyone that joined us on Odyssey, on Rumble on YouTube and the Duran.locals.com. And uh, any final thoughts, Alexander, before we sign uh, off? Pu Putin's and Shoigu speeches are extraordinary. I mean, they're the, the first of all, they're the, the speeches of people who feel themselves winners. That's an important fact already. But... They are. They also gave the appearance to me of people who finally, exactly as Alex said, feel able to express what they have long felt. And it's going to gain traction around the world. People were listening to them, and you can already see people responding to what they're saying. The real pushback on globalization has begun. Yeah. Um, Aftab Khan, thank you for joining the Duran community and Taffy for we will leave it on this thought which is midnight in Oz and all is well oh gosh I think that's a good message to to exit this live stream with Absolutely. midnight in Oz and all is well Wonderful. all right um thank you to everyone for joining us thank you to all the the questions and thank you to all the uh people that watched us on all the various platforms and thank you to our moderators alexander you have a good day richard you welcome did. to the duran community take care everybody